Can you actually become smarter than 99% of people? Or is your intelligence something you're just born with and therefore can't change? Well, I'm not only gonna prove you can change it, I'm gonna show you how. Over my more than 12 years of experience as both a peer-reviewed scholar and an educator, I've come to accept that there are two core aspects of mental ability that, when combined in specific ways, lead to massive increases in intelligence, even if you're not naturally a genius. So let's dive into the first of these mental abilities, what researchers call general intelligence or G-factor. G-factor is the type of intelligence traditionally measured through IQ tests, such as the WAIS assessment. For decades, IQ testing and even the concept of G-factor itself have been controversial topics, with researchers taking roughly two different positions on whether this G-factor intelligence can be changed, and if so, how. On one side of this debate, you have what you might call the genetic camp, which includes such prominent researchers as Richard Heyer. And on the other side of the debate, you have what you might call the environmental camp, which includes such prominent researchers as Richard Nisbet. Researchers in each camp respectively make three main claims with regards to intelligence and IQ. In the genetic camp, these claims are 1. Genetic differences are the main cause of IQ differences. 2. IQ is not changeable, even with better education and resources. And 3. G factor, as measured by IQ tests, is the most important mental ability we should value. In the environmental camp, these claims are 1. Environmental differences are, if not the main cause of IQ differences, at least a significant driver of those differences. 2. IQ is changeable with better education and resources. And 3. G factor, as measured by IQ tests, is important, but other mental abilities are also important. Okay, so then who's correct here? And how does understanding the nuances here help you dramatically increase your own intelligence? Well, to understand this, we have to understand why each camp of researchers takes the position they do. Now, in all honesty, reviewing all the fine points of disagreement between these camps would require probably a video that's several hours long. And so instead, I'll simply offer one example to help you understand the nature of the disagreement. For instance, those in the genetic camp cite evidence that even when people retake IQ tests and get a better score, this score increase does not reflect a true increase in intelligence because this increase does not statistically predict life outcomes and also does not transfer to increased ability on other mental tasks. In short, they claim that these changes in IQ test scores don't reflect true changes in your intelligence. Those in the genetic camp also cite a wide range of very solid research on studies of identical twins to claim that even in different environments, the IQs of twins don't vary significantly. But how do those in the environmental camp respond? Well, for instance, they often cite what is known as the Flynn effect, which is the very real fact that IQ scores keep rising generation after generation, an effect which can't be explained by genetics alone. With respect to increases in IQ, those in the environmental camp often also point out that studies failing to show true increases in IQ scores are largely those conducted on adults, and that when we look at the same types of studies as conducted on children, the score increases and transferability of abilities are statistically significant. To complicate things further, those twin studies well, it's less straightforward than you might think. In July of 2025, a new study published in the very reputable journal Acta Psychologica found that educational interventions had significant impacts on IQ scores, calling into question decades of research on twin IQs. Okay, so then, if we're still debating whether or not your IQ, the measure of your G-factor intelligence, is changeable, how can we definitely state that your intelligence can be increased? Well, while it still might take decades for us to find definitive answers to this question, here's a key point upon which both the genetic camp and the environmental camp would surprisingly agree, namely that changing aspects of your environment can increase your mental ability whether or not your true underlying g-factor changes. And this is a powerful point. To understand how powerful it is for you, you first have to understand how IQ scores themselves are determined. And this is a point that both sides often miss. Generally speaking, your IQ score is a function of the following equation. Observed IQ equals G plus M plus E plus SES plus epsilon. If we accept the claim that your G factor is unchangeable, then the G in this equation represents your fixed ability or 
fixed intelligence level. The M here represents your motivation and effort. The E here represents your education and level of cognitive stimulation. SES here represents your socioeconomic status. And the last term here is random error. This could be test anxiety, fatigue, and so on. And so once again, let's assume for the sake of argument that G here cannot be changed at all. Well, that doesn't change the fact that those other variables can be changed. A fact which, again, both camps acknowledge. Decades of research have shown that motivation and effort, for instance, can lead to notable increases in intellectual performance. Educating yourself through reading and active projects can do the same. And although you can't always do much about your socioeconomic status, you can often take actions to decrease your anxiety and increase your mental energy. The genetic camp would respond here that since you're not increasing increasing G here, you're not really increasing your intelligence. Yet, I take issue with this, and I'm not alone here. Carol Dweck, Robert Sternberg, and others have argued that if we can optimize these factors, and if doing so has practical life outcomes, then the choice not to refer to this as an increase in intelligence is merely pedantic. It's here then that I claim that you can increase your intelligence by optimizing these factors of motivation, anxiety, rest, and self-directed learning. And if you're already watching this video, you can probably already put yourself in the top 24.8% of intelligent people, probably, at least as measured by IQ and G factor. But then what about the remaining 23.8%? How do you actually put yourself into the top 1% of intelligence? And considering everything we've discussed so far, is that even possible? Yes. It is. And you see, this is precisely where things start to get interesting. In his book, What Intelligence Tests Miss, The Psychology of Rational Thought by the cognitive scientist Keith Stanovich, he offers three scenarios to demonstrate the difference between the cognitive abilities IQ tests measure and the thinking dispositions they don't measure. In incident A, a woman walks on a cliffside by the ocean and goes to step on a large rock. But the rock is not a rock at all. Instead, it's actually the side of a crevice, and she falls to her demise. In incident B, the same woman actually makes the decision to jump off the ocean cliff because she is desperate and feels she cannot go on living. In the first case, what cognitive scientists call the algorithmic level of the woman's mind malfunctioned. This algorithmic level of the mind, roughly speaking, is what IQ tests measure. However, as Stanovich goes on to state, incident B does not involve such an algorithmic level information processing error. The computational process is posited at the algorithmic level of analysis executed quite perfectly. No error at this level of analysis explains why the woman is dead. Instead, this woman died because of her overall goal and how these goals interacted with her beliefs about the world in which she lived. And this is a key point. You see, a growing body of research demonstrates that this level of thinking, what we could call critical thinking, does indeed correlate with IQ, but it correlates only weakly, at the level of about R equals 0.3. In other words, a person can have a high level of G-factor intelligence, yet be extremely irrational. I mean, come on, you know what I mean, right? Can you think of someone in your life right now who's super smart but keeps making dumb decisions, has irrational beliefs, or who is just ineffective overall? The fact is, we all know plenty of people like that. And so do you recall we had about a 23.8% gap or maybe less to close in order to get you to the top 1% of intelligence? Well, developing these critical thinking abilities, that's how we get you there. And if you wanna take a deeper dive into building these skills, then check out my free critical thinking masterclass at the link in the pinned comment below. But then wait a second, if that G factor we explored earlier is fixed and unchangeable, is the same true of critical thinking ability? Are some people just innately less rational than others, regardless of training or environment? Well, the good news is that the research on this is now abundantly clear. Critical thinking ability can indeed be increased through training, education, and other environmental inputs. In other words, as long as we consider critical thinking ability to be a form of intelligence, which I think we can, then you absolutely can become more intelligent. In fact, as measured by the Watson Glasser critical thinking assessment, you absolutely can put yourself in the top 1% of school scorers through consistent and persistent training of certain key skills. And these include the following, each of which I'll both define and teach you how to develop. One, purposeful judgment. Two, self-regulation. 
three, analysis and evaluation, four, dispositions, and five, dialogue. Let's take a look at number one here. Imagine two entrepreneurs, both have a new product idea. The first one jumps straight into design because he feels it'll work. The second one pauses, lists his goals, profitability, scalability, and brand alignment, and only then decides what to build first. Months later, the first one burns out. The second one launches successfully. That's purposeful judgment, thinking not just fast or slow, but intentionally. Before any decision, ask, what am I optimizing for? Write it down, make it explicit. And it's number two here, self-regulation, which supercharges this process. Imagine you're arguing with someone online and you suddenly realize you're not trying to find the truth anymore. You're trying to win. The moment you catch that, pause. That instant of awareness, noting the shift from curiosity to ego, is self-regulation in action. In order to practice this, adopt a habit I call a mental checkpoint. Whenever you feel certain, frustrated, or defensive, silently ask, what evidence or logic would make me change my mind? This single question flips your brain from defensive reasoning into metacognitive reasoning, the habit of thinking about your own thinking. And as we'll see, this habit works beautifully alongside number three here, analysis and evaluation. Suppose you read a viral post claiming that a new supplement increases IQ by 20 points. Instead of believing or dismissing it instantly, you ask, who funded the study? How were IQ increases measured? What was the sample size? You then evaluate, does the evidence support the conclusion or is it just telling me what I wanna hear? This kind of thinking is important, yet none of this kind of thinking is possible unless we practice number four here, dispositions. Imagine there's a scientist who spends months trying to prove his own hypothesis, only to realize the data contradict it. Instead of ignoring the evidence, he publishes his findings anyway. That's intellectual courage, and the lack of this is one reason people with high IQ often hold irrational, biased beliefs. But now if this is true, how do we foster this attitude, as well as similar attitudes required for critical thinking? Well, that's by practicing number five here, dialogue. Think of the philosopher Socrates. His genius wasn't in lecturing. It was in asking questions that forced others to think more deeply. Modern research confirms this effect. Students who regularly engage in structured dialogue in which each person must defend and refine their reasoning show dramatic gains in critical thinking ability. Once a week, have a rational dialogue with a friend about an idea you disagree on. But here's the key. Your goal isn't to win, it's to understand their reasoning. It's to constructively think of counterexamples and find hidden assumptions. And you see, when you combine this with every other critical thinking skill we've covered here, you effectively start closing that gap, simply by being willing to engage in the kind of thinking that most people in our world have forgotten, either because they're so brainwashed, so caught up in life, or simply so obsessed with chasing the type of intelligence measured by IQ, you naturally start putting yourself in that top 1%. But in all of this, never forget the most important thing, as you're putting yourself in that top 1%, don't forget to bring as many people with you as possible. If you want to keep leveling up your critical thinking to make a massive impact, not only on your own life, but also on the lives of countless others, then be sure to watch this next video.